All right, welcome back to What in the Hermeneutic. Uh, with me, as always, is Cindy Koch, our uh, student of biblical hermeneutics. And today, uh, for this this uh, episode, we're going to be talking about the text itself, in essence. Um, uh, and uh, you had mentioned uh, before we started that Veltz, in his book, uh, Principles of Biblical Interpretation for Everyone. His chapter on this uh, deals and uh, gives some great sort of history to the development of the text as we have it today. Both old and new. Both Testament. old and new. So, yeah. um, so, so you know, if you've, if you've got the book, the link's always down below. You can uh, you can get your own copy. You can check that out. But we're gonna have a good conversation about kind of like, are we creating a mountain out of a mole molehill? Is this something worth uh, having a conversation about? What do we kind of do with it? Uh, is there assurance? Are we throwing out our Bibles? What's going on? You know, <laughs> not that. Uh, but it'll be a good conversation. As always, we invite you to join in it, uh, participate, uh, continue to share us with uh, your friends and colleagues as well. And uh, let's get after it. Spit out my Lord in every way, yet I'm still welcome in the yard. All right, so one of the things that will often happen in when we have conversations have about hermeneutics and things like that is uh, people, people will say these are sort of like pointy-headed, uh, nerdy problems. We're creating things that aren't really there. You know, you just got your Bible. You're good to go. Why are we ha asking these questions? Why are we... I mean, we kind of addressed a little bit of that already, uh, but... But you always get some pushback for it that we're we're kind of um, we're making too much out of it, yeah. sort of thing. Um, I think something that we maybe realize or that we need to realize is that this is a really complex discussion, and it starts with what we would say is the Word of God, Scripture, the Bible. Like, what even is that that we're talking about? The base level of understanding a text is understanding what the text is okay. and where it comes from. Right. And uh, so I'll be honest, this is not like my favorite part of hermeneutics because, <laughs> because it gets really complex and there are people who know a, a lot sure. about the details sure. of this. And there are a lot of details. There are those uh, beady-eyed people that hide out in the basements <laughs> of libraries. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So if yeah. you are interested in this, I <laughs> highly recommend you find you find one of those people. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I think it just for the nature of our discussion, it's good to realize that this is this is a really big topic that we're talking about, and yeah, it can get complicated at times. But when we are standing back and realizing what we ourselves are bringing to the text and what the text actually is, we should at least know what we're dealing with. We don't need to know all the little pieces and ins and outs of everything. So, so but... yeah, I always thought as a, as a preacher that uh, we're not making this complicated or complex. It is complex. It is. Um, uh, the simple fact that, you know, when you say, okay, let's, we're applying these principles to the text. Well, even that question of what is the text right. isn't so simple. Uh, it's really complex. It's it's ancient manuscripts, uh, incomplete manuscripts compiled mm -hmm. together. Uh, you know, it, so it's not, um, you know, we were both down in Georgia years ago and you would have uh, those kind of like King James only, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if it was good enough for God, it was good enough for us kind of thing. Uh, but that's just not the story. It's not no. a story at all. No. It's very complex. And so if you're just a lay reader, you know, just somebody who loves to read their Bible, I mean, maybe these questions don't necessarily apply sure. to what you're doing, and that's okay. Uh, but if you are, you know, a pastor, if you're uh, trying to get meaning and out of the scriptures to proclaim to other people, and you're just kind of stepping back and wanting to make sure you do it as faithfully and as... Uh, right as possible, I guess you could try to say that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is at least something you need to consider. And uh, working out of the original languages, the Greek and the Hebrew, you're going to see things in your Greek Bible, you know, these little teeny tiny notes all down here, and also in your Hebrew Bible yeah. that are going to tell you things about the actual text. 
like I said, we're not going to go into all the details of all sure. of that, but just to realize that this is not a simple book, you know, that's just been written by one author in our time handed to us. And then, oh, we're just going to find out what it means. Yeah. This is actually a really big. And those, all those little marks in the, in the bottom, um, they don't, they don't make the text unsure. No. They, what they do is they, um, they show us that this is actually rooted in history. There's Correct. a real history to our text. Well, and I think it's, what we have to remember is all of those little marks are a note of how faithful everybody is being to, yeah. so that we have the most accurate text. Right. So what that means is if we're reading along in scripture and um, it's kind of like a little footnote maybe, sure. but behind a word or in front of a word or something like that, it's going to take you down to this body of text that explains all of the other manuscripts that might have a variant reading. That yeah. means maybe something a little bit different, like a different letter or maybe maybe from a different root or something like that. And the funny thing is, is most often it's not that big of a deal. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's never, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so um, both in the Greek and the Hebrew original languages, we'll see these just teeny tiny little variants. And because those who were copying the text and passing the text on, because they wanted to be so faithful right. to what the words actually said, they're trying to expose all of the mistakes. Some of them are just simple copying mistakes. Yeah, you know, you have right. to remember that these manuscripts um, before the printing press, they were just handwritten. You know, a monk was sitting there looking at this thing, writing on this thing. And so some of them are as simple as I missed one letter or maybe I copied one letter yeah. twice or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. I, yeah. I, so, for instance, I, um, I just thought of this the other day. I was translating with the guys for the, the normal talking shop videos and... Um, and uh, we came across a, a note in the, in the Greek text, and it was this asterisk, and I couldn't figure out what it was referring to, but it was like this bold, so I texted you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, look this up. Mm -hmm. and, you, and it was basically saying that it looked like an ancient, like new paragraph was starting, even though it wasn't like, like it started on a new page or yeah. something. And so there was just like, it was sort of like editorial how the spacing was done differently. Right. But they took a note of it yes. and said, hey, you should be aware of this. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, just other things to realize, you know, we're very used to reading in columns with little numbers, you know, so that we can refer to our verse and our chapters yeah. and things like that. That wasn't in the original manuscripts when they were writing right. and copying those things. And so some of those notes will be, you know, it's just something to note, like... Yes maybe the paragraph doesn't line up exactly like it does. Right. So you can sort of see even within different English translations, uh, we'll see some variants of what the text actually is. Yeah. Um, again, this is not like the hugest deal because those variants are so small and it doesn't have to do with the doctrine, the teaching of the church. Because over the years, if there is something that is unclear, the church hasn't made like a strong stand on right. this is the way we're going to go if it seems like the manuscripts or the different traditions aren't agreeing on that. Right. I mean, the point is still Christ crucified for the yeah. salvation of the world. Yeah. I mean, that's that's not changing. Right. So um, again, it's, I think it's just helpful to sort of have this discussion, know that there's variants out there. Um, a significant one, because we maybe it's just because we lived in Georgia and we knew a lot of people who... We're very set on the King, King James translation. Right. Just to realize that that was a translation of the Bible in the 1600s based off of these manuscripts that um, since then we've found even older manuscripts. Sure. And so now the more modern <laughs> translations, yeah, yeah. let's just say like ESV, NIV, those sorts of things, they're taking into account kind of this greater collection yeah. of what yeah. we have found. And so in a sense, um, we even kind of say that, um, you know, if we find more stuff, that's actually going yeah. to impact yeah. what we have as the text or the scripture. And so we, we, we kind of leave that question open because we also want to be as faithful to what we find the text to be as the whole, you know, history of the Christian church has done. 
So not something to get super freaked out about, but just to realize that this is something that we should look at. Okay. Yeah, so to realize you're, you're dealing with, you're asking, uh, hermeneutics is asking serious questions about uh, how we're interpreting it. But those questions will even flow into what is the thing itself we're interpreting? Right. And it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's, it's actually complex. It's a bunch of manuscripts and, uh, and, and it is beautiful and how they've, uh, been preserved and handed down and those things, like you said, the variants aren't grossly different things. Um, but, uh, but that's part of the richness. And like I said before, like the history of this, as it's come to us, there is this organic, rich history to it. Um, and, and so to be aware of that, uh, at least place in. So I would say if you don't have access, if you're not um, uh, studying out of the original languages, if you don't have a group of guys like I do uh, uh, when we do the talk and shop videos um, and you're just kind of on your own, commentaries are great on this. Yes. A good scholarly commentary yes, always true. addresses these issues. They'll, the, as right. they're working through the text, they'll, they'll, maybe not your popular level commentaries, but your scholarly ones for sure, mm -hmm. will address the variance. And they'll say, hey, this is where this came from or why we think this one's the better rendering. And they ask, the, so these are, they're asking good questions of the yes. text. Yes, yes. absolutely. Um, yes, looking for a good commentary that addresses those variants is very important. Um, but sometimes, like I, I just recently had a class with Dr. Robbie and we were looking at Isaiah and what was interesting about that is sometimes uh, also the commentaries can go a little bit too crazy with the textual variants as well. So, um, you know, any questions that you have about those things, if you come across it, you should be able to have a conversation with somebody who knows the original, the Greek and yeah, the Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that's your pastor. Maybe if it's not your pastor, you can find somebody to have that conversation with because uh, sometimes those things can be made a little bit too big of a deal oh, out of, sure. as well. Yeah. Everyone gets. I, I remember uh, years ago, Veltz doing uh, kind of when when people learn like if the straight line is the history of of interpretation, like in general, people learn their Greek and Hebrew, and they're like all over the place. Right. And the better they get at it, they actually come pretty much in line Correct. with what everyone's are. So Correct. so it's not going to be wildly different. Right. Uh, and I mean, this actually is something else to think about when we're thinking about hermeneutics, how we do what we do with the text. Um, this is where textual criticism comes into things. Sure. And so um, if you already have the belief that this is not kind of a cohesive scripture and that, you know, it's been changed over time, then you're going to look for ways to fragment the scripture and actually have it say different things, which is actually an argument against it being as a cohesive word of God. Right. So, I mean, you will find people who are using textual criticism like this for that purpose. I don't think that's helpful for what we're doing here when you're right. trying to translate and preach something. Right. Um, and it's not necessarily faithful to the tradition of what like the Masoretic where the Masoretic text was trying to do and, and everybody else was trying to keep it a pure, whole, meaningful scripture that we could actually like talk about. So for something we uh, you didn't want to talk much about, we talked a lot about that. So uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, <laughs> at least we have to have a baseline. That's right. And about. that's, that's now we don't what have to is. talk about it anywhere. Right, now we right. can talk about the fun stuff. Uh, so thank you for that. Take a moment to like and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. Uh, and I'll share your your insights, your thoughts. Uh, we're going to just keep moving through these conversations in uh, biblical hermeneutics. Uh, so join us for the conversation and God bless your preaching.